Welcome to Campus Chat, a look at the people, the opportunities, programs, and happenings at Western Nevada College. Campus Chat is made possible by the Western Nevada College Foundation. Hello and welcome to Campus Chat. My name is Helene Jesse and this is the show about the people and programs of Western Nevada College. Now today's show is going to be very, very different. We're, we, it, it's a dichotomy what we're talking about. We're going from the industrial revolution to the spiritual revolution really in one show. We're starting off with the Woody Worcester Machine Tool Technology Program. And Paul Eastwood, Professor Paul Eastwood, he just got tenured, I hear. Yes, I did. Yeah, congratulations. Yes, thank you very much. That's the longest probationary period I've ever worked in. Any 90 days is usually the four years was oh, quite a distance. That's great. That's great. And then we're ending up in a Zendo. Nice. And I, I had to look that up. Yeah, I didn't so, look it up. So we'll yeah. find out what a Zendo is, so stay tuned with us. So we're going to be talking about machine tool technology, its role in the community, its role in economic development, why we need machinists, and it's really nice to be here with you, Paul, because under your leadership, this program has become a very highly valued program for our area manufacturers, and you were also involved in the purchase of two, I guess, really high-tech machines we'll be talking about, yes. correct? Right. Yeah, that's exciting. The Rottlers. The Rottler. Yeah. That's cool. So what, I mean, we, we can't get out of the show without talking about the economy and the downturn in the economy. Are there jobs out there still for machinists? Uh, I still get calls, uh, local manufacturers. Some of the local manufacturers are still looking for uh, beginners, intermediate, and uh, experienced machinists, which can range from manual machines to CNC machines. And uh, grinders, uh, just a variety. Uh, others have uh, unfortunately had to lay off individuals, and some have moved out of the uh, out of the area. But uh, quite a few have stayed in, and they've been able to um, keep working. Some find some find jobs, but yes, some manufacturers are still looking for for individuals. Now, when you talk about manual machines, are those the lathes and the mills? Are those the manual machines? Or? Well, they're manual. Is uh, you run them by hand? Uh, you crank the handles, as we call it. And the uh, CNC's computer and numerical control are the uh, uh, automatic machines. So we, we have two different types, but they're both mills and grinders and uh, lathes. Right. So each right. one of those can be either manual and or CNC, that is correct. which is computer numerical control. Right. That's I used to know a lot about machining. No? Yeah. Well, you ought to come down and take a course and... <laughs> I, oh, Get your I did. Hands dirty. I, mean, I used to do. <laughs> yeah, it used to be a lot of fundraising for uh, machining, and actually, Paul and I are going to go out and start raising money for scholarships. So, well, that's good right. to hear that there's still um, this is still a, a good opportunity for a student to come in and um, get oh, trained and get some good job skills. Hey, well, the majority of your students are they do they have jobs? Are they coming here for upgrades, or are they just learning the whole? It's a split. Uh, I have uh, construction workers that are uh, not happy with what's going on with the uh, housing, so they've decided to change their vocations and uh, their vocation, and they're they're getting into machining. They're good with their hands, so they they like like getting them dirty, and this is a good spot to to uh, yeah. get. Yeah, oh yeah, it's a it's a good vocation change. Uh, and not too distant future, I would imagine that the economy will pick up. And uh, I've already seen it around here. Like I said, I've had several phone calls looking for individuals. And uh, uh, machining has always been an excellent trade to get into. Mm -hmm. One of the last, uh, no matter what you look at, uh, driving your car inside your house, a machinist has had something to do with every single thing that, that you look at. Uh, mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a great location. The ones who were laid off in the machining trade, uh, are coming up to school to advance their their skills. So uh, you know, it, it, like I say, it's a split as to new individuals coming in and, right. and those in the trade just want to come in and upgrade their skills. What kind of a class would a beginning? I mean, what's the difference between a beginning machinist and an advanced machinist as far as classes here? Knowledge. Knowledge. Yeah, it's, it's uh, the more time you put into a, a anything trade, uh, your education. Uh, you, you start off with a high school education, let's say. Uh, you can get a two-year degree, four-year degree, 
master's and a Ph.D. It's the same thing in machining. It's, it's all the time you put in on that particular um, education you're going for. I, I know that there's a, a thing called tolerance level, and that, that can be pretty, I mean, when you're machining a part, it can be pretty exact. Right. About we, uh, that. Uh, as you move along in, in uh, uh, my shop classes, shop one is uh, manual lathe, shop two, manual vertical milling machine and surface grinding. When they get into the surface grinding, uh, all our projects here are machine tools that you're going to use in the trade. When you get into the one, two, three blocks and the, and the precision vices that you can make, the tolerances are, are held to... Uh, uh, one ten thousandth of an inch. Uh, That's pretty impressive. Yeah. One so, ten thousandth of an inch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here is three thousandths. You split that into three sections. That'll give you one thousandth. And if you take one thousandth and split that into ten segments, then you have one ten thousandth, which is extremely accurate. Yeah. yeah. That's. That's pretty amazing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to come back. We alluded to uh, uh, Paul um, talking about some brand new machinery. That's how much is it? How much were these machines? One of them is right behind us, the Rottler. Our, our is this a CNC? This is a yeah. CNC. This is uh, one of the newest uh, type out. Uh, very friendly uh, computer controller right here is where all the information is fed into. Uh, very friendly. I'm I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm okay with computers, but I'm I'm the old school, but I've had to keep up with the new technology, and uh, yeah, that's. Uh, so and how much was this particular this machine? This particular right machine here? was uh, approximately uh, 137 to 140 thousand dollars. Wow! So you can come up here and learn on the very latest technology. Stay with us. We'll be right back, and we'll talk a little more more about these machines. Back to Campus Chat. My name is Helene Jesse, and we're at the Woody Worcester Machine Tool Technology Center on the Carson campus. I'm here with Professor Paul Eastwood. He's our machine tool technology instructor, and we're, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about this $140,000 uh, CNC machine behind us. And what did you decide upon this machine? I mean, what does it do that's different than the others? Uh, after a little bit of research, I found that Rottler, uh, all the videos that I've watched on rebuilding engines, uh, machining engines, uh, I found that uh, most of the DVDs and videos have Rottler machines in them, which piqued my interest. But I had done a little uh, investigation. There's Sonnen and a few others out there. And uh, Rottler seemed to have the best reputation, number one. Number two, it's, it's made, built in the U United States, which I was real happy with. Number three, it's built in Washington State which is uh, just up the road a little, and the two individuals that service the machines and train are less than four hours away over in California, one's in Sacramento and one's in Santa Rosa. Real nice guys, uh, uh, Jim Montgomery and Jeff, uh, the one who sold us uh, the machines, just excellent, excellent individuals and uh, willing to help. Uh, like I say, we're just in the beginning stages. We're, we've machined a couple of blocks. <clears throat> you can see one on the, on the uh, machine here. This particular machine will bore uh, surface, line bore the uh, crankshaft. Uh, we can also machine the heads for, for the uh, motors also, which is we're trying to tie it in with our automotive program here so that uh, actually we have uh, eight rebuilding motors in the automotive right at this time. So they're just about ready to bring their blocks in, and uh, as they watch, we'll machine them for them and hopefully will interest them in coming down here and taking our, our classes here also. Uh, the you'll other machine that we use didn't... These, you'll actually didn't. use these blocks in a car then? Oh yeah, they're, they're rebuilding their own motors, so that, mm -hmm. that's the exciting thing about it is they can come down and watch, the uh, watch their blocks being machined, honed, and then they'll reassemble them down in automotive. Now eventually I'm hoping that they will come down here and take the classes and then they'll learn how to run the machine themselves and that way they can actually go out and find jobs in the automotive uh, industry. Uh, I have several students from Wyotech 
and uh, UTI, which are the automotive programs in Sacramento and Phoenix, that are come in for the machining program. So, uh, you know, that, that's that's pretty exciting that they want to be able to rebuild the motors plus machine them. Uh, so that that is a big deal. You can get it actually dual skill, so if you can't get a job in the automotive industry, hopefully you can get a correct. job in the machining industry. I think that's great. So do you have to be an experienced machinist to use this machine then? You said it was yeah. fairly easy. Yes, yeah, you need to uh, take machine one and two, which are the manual programs. Uh, once you reach the manual, uh, you know, pass the manual programs, then we will train you on the CNC's. How many students do you have working on these machines right now? Uh, just myself and uh, uh, Matt Yanji, who uh, who is an assistant who is running the machines. Yeah. We, being brand new uh, machines here, we haven't had the time to uh, properly advertise what we have. So this, this, hopefully so, this will pique some interest. Out right, there. and so for next fall, fall right. 2009, you can sign up and if you're interested and right. really start going on a program of Anyone, learning anyone how to do who, this. who has taken the class so far, machine one and two, they can enroll for the CNC classes. What are the machine tool classes offered? Days, evenings? Uh, Monday and Wednesday morning, uh, 9 to 11.45, and then I have evening classes, which are Monday through Thursday from uh, 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock, and we have uh, high school classes that come in at 12 o'clock to uh, 2 o'clock. Oh, that's great. So you're busy. Very busy. you got classes morning, noon, and night. Right. So basically, if you're interested in machining, you can come in the morning or you can come at night. I think that's good. You can... So if you Very work flexible. An odd shift, or right. so you talked about that high school program. How is that going? Pretty good. Uh, I have 26 students right at this time. Uh, they're all uh, well. They range from juniors to seniors. I'd really like to try to get the freshmen, freshmen and sophomores mm -hmm. in also. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's going well. So are they actually are these students actually interested in a machine, or do they just want to get out of high school? They're they're not sure. I think yeah. it's a split. So we we try Happen to keep half, them busy, huh? right? We try to keep them busy at the best we can. Uh, actually, I have four uh, that will probably uh, immediately at the end of their senior year will go into the machine tool field. Oh, I think that's excellent. There there are a couple of uh, local companies that are looking for apprentices, and it'd be absolutely perfect for the oh, that's uh, great. for these students. So so where can let's. Give our viewing audience your contact information so if they're out there and they would like to take a machining class, just learn about the industry or get involved in any part of the program, how do they do that? Well, as long as I'm open, we have, what, five weeks left and they can come in at any time and look around while the students are, are actually machining. Or if you would like to call, uh, it's Paul Eastwood at Western Nevada College. The number is 445-4421. And uh, my email, E-A-S-T-W-O-O-5 at W-N-C dot E-D-U. Yeah, that's great. It's really uh, nice being here, Paul. You've done a great job. And uh, like I said, I've been involved with uh, the evolution of this uh, program for a long time. It's really nice to see it thriving. That's, uh, yeah, you've uh, done a great job. Great, great shop. I really yeah, like it. It's a great shop. Well, thank you for watching this segment of campus chat. Now don't be surprised because when you when we come back we're gonna be somewhere totally different. Totally different. So stay tuned. Welcome back to Campus Chat. My name is Helene Jesse, and I told you we'd be in a different spot from the Machine Tool Technology Center. We are now in the beautiful Zendo of Zen Meditation Instructor Richard Thornley. And Richard teaches a meditation class for community education at Western Nevada College. And I understand that this is one of their most popular classes. So thank you for inviting us into this beautiful place. Well, thanks for coming. It's really it's a passion of mine to talk about meditation. So. Yeah, and I really look forward to talking to you about it as someone who has practiced meditation over the years. I was excited about this topic and really looking forward to, to coming here. So this is very nice. We 
uh, I think when we talk, well, first of all, let's talk about you. When did you start practicing meditation, and how were you introduced to it? I started in 1995, um, and as a lot of happens with a lot of people, I came to it sort of out of um, what seemed to be a negative experience at the time. Um, actually, we were my dad had prostate cancer and was living over in Sonoma, and we were going to visit him. And I just, for the first time in my life, felt um, the impermanence of life, you know, in, in my bones, not just, I mean, we all know that life is impermanent, but uh, it was really the first uh, brush with death with a really, really, you know, close, close family member. And so it it sort of woke me up, you know, and, and uh, Zen had been in the background for basically all my life, but I'd never had time for it. or I, It had always intrigued me, but it, it be, you know, it spoke to me at that point because it's a central tenet of Zen is impermanence. So, so that's oh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, it, um, it turned out to be a very fortunate event, and I was much more able to be with my dad in his passing. So well, in, in permanence in the sense that all things must pass, try not to grasp on to anything or have some kind of ownership over it. That's, is that what you mean? Or? Yeah, that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin, I guess, is, uh, is um, take the opportunity while it's there, you know. I mean, um, sure, you know, don't attach the things as part of it, but it's also wake up. You know, this is your chance to wake up. I loved your reference to waking up because one of my favorite authors was Anthony DeMello. He's a Catholic Jesuit priest, and his, I have some uh, cassette tapes. He'd always say, wake up, wake up. You know, you're asleep. Just wake up. And so I, I think that's an important, important message for us because right. we can't just zone out. Yeah, and, and Buddha actually means awakened one. That's all it means. And in fact, when we when we bow to Buddha, we have a, a Buddha on the altar that we're not. It's not worshiping in the traditional sense. It's it's bowing to our own awakened self in a non-dualistic way. So it's um, and it's important for people to know that that it's that this is not about uh, adopting a particular set of beliefs. It's it's you can be a Christian, you can be a Jew, you can be a Muslim, and still practice that. Still meditate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's very interesting, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But I want to talk about the zendo itself. Okay. Is there a, a particular significance to its decor and the way it's set up, or? Well, actually, yeah, there is one. It, it's basically patterned on the zendo at the Sonoma Mountain Zen Center. This is actually an affiliate zendo of the Sonoma Mountain Zen Center, which is between Glen Ellen and, and Santa Rosa. And so we have the altar in the same, you know, facing north. We have the picture of Suzuki Roshi over, you know, on the, the mm -hmm. east side. And that's, uh, that charming gentleman is, uh, is Bodhidharma. And, uh, and they have similarly situated representations of the same people. For example, the east is like the rising of the sun. Is that what that means, like the four directions, or yeah, kind of. You know, like I, west is death, you know, death to the ego, perhaps. Okay. I don't, know. I don't know. We, it's really our I'm practice searching. is really oriented toward toward the physical act of practicing. Mm -hmm. There's um, there's very little um, teaching about Buddhism or the history of Buddhism. It's really all about practice, and that's why it can go hand in glove with with any religion or no religion, basically. And so what is the purpose of meditation then, Zen meditation? <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> we have three minutes in this segment. <laughs> uh, the purpose is to see things as they really are. I mean, I'm not a Zen teacher. I'm. That would be a great question for a Zen, you know, somebody who's received Dharma trans transmission and, you know, has been studying Zen for their whole lives, but um, as from what I, my reading and my practice and the talks I've heard, it's, it's to see things without seeing them through the filter of our egos or the small self. But seeing things, and, and it's, it sounds easy, but it's not so easy. 
Well, we have years and years of programming. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, we have all these impressions that, yes. that aren't even ours. Conditioning and core beliefs and things that affected us long before we had you know, memory of it. I find that when it's rare, trust me, it's rare, when I really see, see it for what it is. But you know when it happens is when I'm outside mm -hmm. in nature and when I'm out in the desert. That's, for me, um, very meditative and where I can kind of escape. Mm -hmm. this life, you know, this, yeah. the head, the yeah. ego. It's yeah, yeah. Um, that happens to me, too. I'll notice after, you know, a good long period of sitting that I'll, I'll walk outside and I'll see a branch sway, and it'll just, you know, capture me. It'll just, you know, suddenly I'm not there. You know, it's just the branch and, you know, and that chatter and all of that stuff that we think of as ourselves, which really isn't, um, kind of just dissipates, and it's wonderful. And so <laughs> that's what the the stilling of the mind, of that chatter, that's what you practice in here. That, yeah, that's part of it, but it, it can also be very tumultuous. I mean, it can be that we sit and we watch our mind. We watch where our mind goes. Mm -hmm. So suppose, you know, we, we focus on our breathing, and then say I have a thought, um, my wife really made me angry today. And then I notice that without judgment, go back to the breath. I have another thought. My boss really made me angry last week. You know, mm -hmm. no judgment, back to the breath. You know, that other driver really made me angry. You know, and pretty soon you see, you know, a lot of anger issues coming up. So sometimes it's not so peaceful. But but the way through to peace is, is through that. It's not mm -hmm. taking a vacation from life. It's, it's dealing with it life directly and that's what our practice has to do that's great that's it's very interesting let's take a quick break and we'll be right back with more of richard thornley and his class at western nevada college Welcome back to Campus Chat. My name is Helene Jesse, and I am in the Zendo of Zen instructor Richard Thornley. And we were talking about um, the practice of meditation and noticing thoughts and sitting without judgment. What are some of the other benefits of meditation? Well, uh, it, 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 it's counterintuitive, but the, the, we're encouraged to sit without a gaining idea, which is very, very difficult to do because everything we do uh, we do for a purpose and for a reason but but lots of things happen I mean if you go into Zen practice with a set of rigid expectations then uh, you're probably going to be disappointed but uh, but if you go in it just with a sense of curiosity and I'm going to do this and let's see what happens mm -hmm. um, you know that's that's when you can I mean, I get feedback that I'm a very calm person. I'm, I don't feel calm, <laughs> but that's the feedback I get. And I, and I think it's because I, I've been able to create a gap between something that triggers me and my usual habitual reaction. So instead of just firing off when a driver cuts me off or something, and I mean, I'm not saying that I'm able to do this all the time, but sometimes... You know, you loosen the grip that your habitual patterns have on you, you know, your habitual responses. And it gives you, in that gap, you have an opportunity to choose a different response. That's a lot of freedom for in that, isn't it? Yes, there, that's, that's the key word. A lot yeah. of freedom. Yeah. Is there a wrong way to meditate then? I mean, it's pretty, uh, because, frankly, I've meditated flat on my back before. Yeah. I, I mean, is I, that... I think the only wrong way to meditate is a way that would be physically injurious to you. Um, uh, and, and, and that's really, really uh, important. It's, it's, you know, people want to sit cross-legged. They want to 
do this and do that. And I really emphasize, I give people lots of time in the class to try out everything because you really just need to be in a stable, settled place because you're going to be dealing with, you know, um, you know, lots of sometimes tumultuous stuff or, you know, uh, compulsions to scratch your head or to, you know, move or, you know. And, and it's okay. Isn't it okay? I mean, if you got an inch, scratch it or not? Well, in, in Zen practice, we, we try to, before we do that, we try to focus on the impulse to do that mm -hmm. and just be aware of it first so that we create that little space. Do you teach other types of meditation or just the Zen? Just the walking meditation in, oh. in the Zen. We have the Zazen, which is sitting on the cushions of the chairs or the benches. Mm -hmm. Or, or then, chairs. You don't have to sit on them. Right. That's important right. to know. I sit in a chair most of the time. And uh, then the walking meditation is kind of the same process, but it, it gives your legs a rest. We'll sit 30 minutes, do 10 minutes of walking meditation, and then sit down for another 30 minutes. Now I understand you're taking the class. You take the class on a field trip. Yeah, at the end we're going to the Sonoma Mountains. Oh, yeah. that's neat. <laughs> yeah, that's so neat. It's on 80 acres in the heart of the wine country. It's oh, absolutely. So you boring. spend the night there, or just go for a day trip? Uh, we'll spend the night. We spend the night. Get up early. Do the Saturday morning practice. Then there's a buffet, oh, vegetarian lunch. That sounds great. At noon, it is. Great. That sounds really great. <laughs> the Zendo is made out of an old barn. There's all this old barn wood and it's, you know, these soft wooden floors. It's just gorgeous. That's great. Now, how many, how often does this class meet? Once a week. Once a week. Yeah. Uh, what night? Thursday night. Thursday night. Thursday. And how long does the class last? It goes 90 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so that, would you recommend uh, people meditate twice a day for a half hour in the morning and, and at night or? Well, uh, it's, it's, really important to be consistent. That's far more important than how long you meditate. Mm -hmm. It's creating the routine so that it becomes an anchor in your life. And it, even if it's five minutes a day, if you can do it consistently, preferably at the same time, then then you've established a groundwork for a serious practice. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, I do every morning. Every morning uh -huh. I get up. And so it sets my the intention for my day. Right. And I, I found myself not, you know, if someone cuts me off, I can't always assume that I'm going to respond the right way. But most of the time I say, hey, that's that's not the hill I'm going to die on today. Okay? <laughs> you know, I mean, if there's some child abuse out there or someone beating somebody up, maybe that, that I'll rise to the occasion then. Uh -huh. But, you know, if you leave the toilet lit up, hey, you know, I, that's okay. <laughs> you know? I think we get so caught up in these what's right and I got to yeah. be right that it's just, it's nuts. Yeah, it's it crazy. Is, it is crazy. <laughs> so I, I, you got to sign up for this class because I'm telling you, it, it feels great here. <laughs> it's so calm and like, do, I mean, couldn't you just sit here and like work? <laughs> I mean, this is great. Uh, it smells great. The windows, the light, it's just beautiful. So how um, does someone get a hold of you to learn more about uh, this Zen meditation class, or if they want to just talk to you about it? Uh, they can call me. My phone number is 883-1946. And then, or email? Or email Richard E. Thornley at hotmail.com. Now, is, it, is the class open-ended, or is it a semester-type class? It's, it was a semester class. This time, I, then I'm going to do a summer class, which obviously will be shorter. Oh. And I'm going to see how that goes. I think it might be better to shorten it up during the semester right. and maybe do two sections. Oh, that sounds great. You yeah. know, my girlfriend and I used to teach Inner Peace 101 at the college. Good. Yes, and we did that for three years. And, of course, we said at the beginning, we have not achieved Inner Peace yet. We are just facilitators. <laughs> but it was a great way for us to um, – we meditated. We uh -huh. did – artistic and creative type work. We used the artist way by Julia Cameron. Oh, yeah. that was, it, was, yeah, it was great. That's that from my wife, yeah. So the summer class starts when? Uh, I think it's early June. I'm not sure of the date. Early June. Yeah. Whenever summer school starts. Yeah. And then it's Thursday night still right. then? Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock? 5.30. 5.30? So 5 you can come right after work. Yep. Oh, that's great. <laughs> 
Oh, thank you so much. You're what a pleasure just to be here, and thank you once again for inviting us in. It's, thank you. I yeah, thank you, Namaste. I mean, just so very. I can't know a little. <laughs> <laughs>